Um, last week we finished up on grace, but we have to lock these in together because uh, there is no way that you can move into faith without understanding what grace does. Last week from Romans chapter 5 verse 1 says this, having therefore been justified by faith. So the faith justifies us into the body of Christ. That's how we get there. It's all of the work of Christ and his finished work that allows us to be justified. Therefore, having been justified, past tense verb, by faith, we have peace with God through the Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace. So you see, you can't take them apart. There's, there's, there's no way. When you talk about faith, you have to have grace. When you talk about grace, you have to have faith. So having been justified by faith, we have peace with God, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience works uh, character, and character works hope and hope never disappoints. So locking that together, we move forward. Now, the first observation we're going to make, because they come in threes, we're going to share three threes today about this. Every one of you will go through three, at least three seasons of your faith. Jimmy read about the first one, no faith, none. You don't have any. You cannot have a faith in Jesus Christ until you go through a relationship with Jesus Christ. In other words, you don't wake up one day and say, you know what, this would be a good day to be saved. I'm going to be saved today. You are saved when the Holy Spirit draws you into that relationship. That's when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Because if you look in Romans 5, verse 5, it says, whom the Spirit was given to each of us. When? At the moment of faith, when we came to Jesus Christ. Baptism doesn't create that. Baptism is an identification measure. And so uh, the faith factor is this. You can't measure grace. You, You just can't find a measurement for grace. Paul said it like this. um, Having all sufficiency in all things may abound to every good work. That's what grace is. It's all. It's big. You know why? It's an eternal factor. Grace comes from God. He's given to us, so it's all. He gives all men and women liberally. The grace, you have the grace that you need to walk through anything that you're walking through. I went through the first seven months of this COVID mess having, think, having thought that, boy, you know, we're good. We're, we're clear. We're everything. And the next thing you know, uh, I have a grandson and his wife down. I have a grandson who flew to San Antonio to start basic training. They quarantined him. He's down. My son has COVID pneumonia. His wife down. Uh, My son called me yesterday, and then Jan and me, um, my son called me yesterday. His father-in-law just passed away with COVID. We'll have to do his service this week. He he got it the same day I did. We talked to each other about our symptoms. Next thing you know, he's on a ventilator. Next thing you know, I never talked to him again. Um, God gives grace for whatever you are walking through. I'm going to say something this morning. We've already had prayer, and Brother Bo, I missed our prayer time. You're going to have to lasso me and drag me in there. I get to meeting folks back there, and the next thing I know, I'm, 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 I'm out of whack. But it's not, there's something about me not right if I don't make that prayer in there on my knees with these men with their hands laying on me. I know you did. I know you did, but you need to pray harder. You should have stayed in there longer. Uh, a preacher said to me this week, uh, are you going to ask the people to pray for the president? And I thought, I have been asked dumb questions all week. (laughs) But that's about the dumbest. Of course. And for the people who have gone to their social media with with saying the most ridiculous of things, um, it, it, it just bears the true heart. Uh, so this morning, of course, we're going to stop and pray for our president. Father, we love you. We thank you for a beautiful day to serve you. 
And Lord, standing at these 10 different doors, walking around with our pastors, with our leaders, uh, Lord, even seeing uh, Scott this morning on, on the cane and Miss J still home, Lord, so many aren't here today. We've missed some of them for seven months now who are still at risk. We pray for them. And we pray, Lord, in voice to the president that you'll heal his body and for the first lady as well and for all those who surround him. Lord, I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. You can't measure grace, folks. It's, it's there. It's all that you need for whatever you're going through. Regardless of, of uh, your past, what you've thought, and, and my family life is different than many folks in that I, I haven't had a father since I was five years old. My mother died uh, very young. I was in my 30s when she passed away. I haven't had a grandparent since I was 10 years old. So I, I have seen death, 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 death. I understand it. I have stood at the graveside of so many hundreds and hundreds of families. I did a virtual COVID funeral this week for a precious lady who worked with our children there at Alma for more than 30 years. Couldn't be with them. No one else was in the funeral home. I did it all, the singing and all, did it all virtual. This week I will do two more COVID funerals. Uh, it, it's personal, it's real, you hurt with people, but I'm going to tell you, God's grace is sufficient for everything that you are going through. So even though my family may be, may be different than your family, but your family is just as powerful, as important to you as mine is to me. That's why when Jimmy hears Miss Rita sing, that's the only singer on the platform for him. Why? Because, and I, I don't know, uh, you, you know how you feel about this, but... Every person who walks through these 10 doors is going to spend eternity somewhere, and they are important in God's eyes. Amen. That's how we have to feel about God's grace. So it can't be measured. We've got that, right? It cannot be measured. It's sufficient for all things. There's dying grace. There's living grace. There's grace to meet tomorrow's trial. Uh, and so what is the difference in between uh, grace and faith, because we have to have faith in order to understand grace. We have to have the grace to understand that everything comes by faith. Well, here it is. You've been wondering what this tape is for. Faith is always measured. Always, 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 always. Anytime faith is mentioned, the, the word faith itself is mentioned more than 250 times. Most of those are in the, in the New Testament. Now, the word belief and trust and all of that, if you add it together, it would be more than 450 times. But the word faith itself, 250 some odd times, is measurable. Did you know that the basis of all medicine, when you go to your, your GP, uh, what is the first thing when you walk in, how you doing, you're looking through the mirror, you got your mask on, uh, and they come back with me, what, where are they taking you? Yeah, they're going to weigh you. You know why? It's the basis of all, medicine, of all, of all basic medicine is that um, about 100 years ago or so, uh, some warped guy in a room uh, put a table together that if you're 5'9 and you weigh this, you are, you are moderately obese and you're morbid obese and then all, this, all these terms uh, that they give to you. So that's the basis of medicine. It can be measured. Why? Because they're using that as a stick. They're using that as a measurement uh, for basic health. And, uh, oh, I've, I can show you a few tricks on the scales that I've learned. Do you know that on the new digital scales, that if you hold, you can hold one foot up slightly and you can adjust that, for, but you have to be very good. You have to stand still because the last time the nurse caught me, I shaved five pounds with just picking that up and adjusting. You got to be good at it though. Um, faith is always measured. The first point that Brother Jimmy brought to us was in the boat, uh, there was no faith, absolutely none. So we're going to look at that. But here are the three seasons of your faith. There's no faith, there's little faith, and there's great faith. You will go through those. There are periods and times in your life when, when uh, faith has failed you or you have failed faith and, and it's non-existent. There are times when you got a little bit, and there are times when, look out world, I'm here. Uh, and I'm, I'm ready to do battle. So uh, when we look at this measurement then, why is it that, that faith is always measured? Because grace is an eternal concept. Grace comes from God, does it not? Where does faith come from? Where does faith come from? 
Think about it for just a moment now. Where does faith come from? How do I? And why is it always measured? Why is it continually measured? Because your faith is built or destroyed from within. It's not an eternal concept. It is something he gives you to do. It comes from God. Sure, the ability to be saved comes from God. You can't just walk up and be saved. It has to come from God. But I'm telling you this, that the, the ability to destroy your faith comes from him. Why? Because he says, uh, Paul says, remember Hymenius? Those guys have made shipwreck of their faith. What happened? They started out. Uh, who was the other brother with, uh, with Paul? And then he, and he backed out and all of a sudden he's not there. Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. What happened to his faith? He was, he was just as saved as those other guys. How did he lose that faith? So this morning we're going to look at the difference then of, of why faith is always measured and grace is never measured. Because this comes from God in dump truck loads to the site where it needs to be, while this comes from within. And what you are willing to do or not to do in order to have and to see faith. Wow. Uh, there's a beautiful verse from um, 2 Timothy. Paul says this, I have fought a good fight. Anybody ever been in a fight? I don't, I don't you know, because if we say that, then, then you had to be in the bar. And I said, how many have been in the bar, in the bar fight? I'm not talking about that, uh, but I am talking about that. When I went to the Army, they, one of the cool things you could do was if you wanted, if you boxed, you got out of a lot of different duties. I said, hey, I'll give that a shot. So I go over there. Hey, have you ever boxed? Shelton, you ever boxed? No, sir, I don't know. I don't know how to put the gloves on. Now, my little brother's different. He is a Golden Gloves boxing champion. Uh, he only weighs like 109 pounds, so he's in there in the little guy's league. But, and I weighed that much in the third grade. So uh, anyway, is, do you know anything about boxing? No, not really. Not, but I mean, how hard can it be? I'm a country boy from Arkansas. Met a young boy from Bronx, the Bronx in New York. He was the, I'll let y'all get in there and spar a little bit. That boy hit me 19 times before I hit the ground. Now, I got up from that and started trying to unlace those things. I don't like that fighting thing. It is hard. I fought a good fight. There are, there are three factors now in this faith. First, fight a good fight. You have to understand, folks, that faith is going to be a fight all the way through. and ain't never going to get any better. And those of you who are just like, how are you? Now, I always say on top of the mountain, I say that. that that's, that's what I do. But sometimes I lie. I'm looking for the mountaintop, and sometimes it's a very small mountain that I'm on. But here's the thing. Faith is always going to be a fight. It's never going to change. You've got to get that in your system that it's always going to be a fight. There's always going to be a fight. I fought a good fight, too. I have finished the track, the race, the course. So there must be a completion of the faith. It's one thing to fight the good fight of faith. It's another thing. You've got to finish. It's not how well you start. It's how well you finish this thing. And then the third factor of this is, I kept the faith. I kept it. Now, what does that mean? So, who kept it? He didn't say God kept it. He said, I, I kept it. I walked through this life. Uh, on Wednesday, probably when I do the, the COVID funeral of a man who loved, loved his family, loved the Lord, um, loved life, loved horses, horse trader, just a great guy. He didn't want to go on the ventilator. And his wife said, you're going to have to. And he said, I'll never come off of it. And he told her goodbye the day he went on it. He knew what he was talking about. He knew what he was talking about. That's fight. You've got to fight the fight. But you also have to finish it. Very few of us will ever have any control on how you go out, folks. You'll have no control on how you finish life. You have none. That's why grace is so important. You have to reach a point that it says to you, it doesn't matter. It just doesn't matter to me. I was in the, up in the upper highlands of uh, Guatemala. With, I had a medical team, a construction team, an evangelism team. And we were building a beautiful church in a, in a place called Ulapa. And I went down with an upper, it was some sort of a jungle fever. 
I lost three days. They took me back down. I looked at the hospital, and I said, look, I ain't going in there. I got better chances laying out here on the ground than I do in there. But anyway, uh, I lost four days. Then I lost five days. And so uh, Jan was not, of course, on, allowed to go on that trip, but uh, she called, and Joe told her, said where I was and what I was doing. And, and that, that was the first moment by which I thought, Lord, I'm not, I'm not making this. But now it's no longer about the faith that I have in Christ. It's about the grace that I have that he has given to me in that moment. Now I resurrected. They got me on a plane, and thanks to American Airlines who helped me, get me, got me back, got me back to America, pumped me full of all kinds of stuff, and I'm, and I'm through it. But for just a brief portion of life, I thought, well, I don't think I'm going to make this. I'm going to die in a, in a village here in, in Guatemala. But here's the concept that I want you to understand about this measuring of, of, of this faith is it's a fight, folks. And, and if you're signing up for anything else, you've got the wrong club. It's a fight. It's a battlefield. This culture, we are now headlong at odds. We are now in a full-blown world-class collision uh, with, with faith and those who don't have it. Governor of uh, Virginia just signed the law. It's a $1,000 fine for a preacher if he violates their COVID rule. Um, Newsom in California. Uh, did you know, by the way, uh, that they are trying to recall him? Uh, the citizens of California are trying to recall him. Uh, he, he has increased. He's doubled down on his deal. Of course, his, aunt, his aunt's name is Nancy. Uh, that may help you out understand why he is so anti-God, anti-church, uh, anti-Christian, anti-prayer, anti-the flag. Um, but anyway, uh, we're in a battle. It's a head-on collision, folks. So I have fought a good fight. I have kept this faith. I've, what does that mean? How do I keep faith? And that's what we're going to look at this morning. So let's get, let's get to it, shall we? If and it, 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 the thing about this, this whole concept of faith is if God could close the, the lion's mouth for Daniel, he can help you. If he can part the Red Sea for Moses, he can help you. If he can make the sun stand still for Joshua, he can help you. If he can put a baby in Sarah's arms, he can help you. If he can raise Lazarus from the dead, folks, there's enough grace if you have enough faith for you to make it through this thing. Amen. So here we go. On the same day when evening had come, he said to them, let us cross over to the other side. The other side is where faith takes us, folks. It's a journey. It's always a journey. Every time Jesus put the fellows in the boat, there was going to be a life lesson. Every time. When Jesus said, get in the boat, I could just see disciples. Oh, no. Because <laughs> there's this life lesson that's always going to come. Uh, now, he's just spent the entire day in parables, and no one understood them. Uh, verse 10, uh, chapter 4, but when he was alone, those around him with the 12 asked him about the parables. Like, what are you doing? It says that he spoke all day. Verse 33, and with many such parables, he spoke the word to them as they were able to hear it. But without a parable, he did not speak. Literally, everything that Jesus did all day. And if you look at chapter 4, it's filled with with these parables, no one understood it. He's tired, they're tired. And, and verse 13, he said to them, do you not understand this parable? He's talking to the disciples. How then will you understand all the parables? Because I haven't even started yet. Why did Jesus do such a thing? Why would he speak all day long and no one understand him? Because he is laying the foundation and the groundwork for what faith must do when grace gets a hold of you. Did the disciples do any better than all the other people? Not a bit better because two times in two different places in the same chapter, they said, what are you talking about? What? Have you ever had that? With, you ever read the parables of Jesus? Like the, the kingdom of heaven is like, the kingdom of heaven is like, the kingdom of heaven is like, and he makes these analogies about what it is that cannot be understood until you first come through faith, through grace, and then you understand that it's all about what he's laying the groundwork for the church. On the same day, he said to them, let's go to the other side. Other side's always faith. Other side's a lesson. Now, when they had left the multitude, they took him along the boat as he was. Other little boats were with him. Always remember this. Always remember this. There are other folks, other folks following you 
trying to go with you. Trying to go with you. You got to remember that. That's what guards my mouth. You know, my ears have never, ever one time got me in trouble. Not so much. There's others trying to go with you. They're emulating your faith. Listen, if, you're a, if you work at anything in schools, this is quite possibly the most insane time of your life. There are too many options. That no one really knows what's going on. It's not sustainable, let me tell you this. This is not sustainable. These schools cannot, they cannot offer five different methods of going to school. It's never going to work, never going to be sustainable. But you've got to remember all those little lives who follow you are emulating you for a reason bigger than you, bigger than you. There were many other little boats with him, and a great windstorm arose. Now, there are three factors. Again, everything is in numbers of three today. There are three factors of what they're up against. First, uh, verse 37, a great windstorm arose. Two, uh, and the waves beat into the boat so that they were already filling. The boats were filling up. And three, but he was in a stern asleep on a pillow, and they woke him and said, Teacher, don't you care that we are perishing? There are three things that he's up against, the water, the waves, the wind. That's, that's the enemy. And that's the boat educational course for the day. We're going to learn when you put water, waves, and wind together, it ain't good. It's never good. Now, uh, th that's the fight of the day. This is going to be the faith lesson of the day. And that's why he's, Jesus got his tape measure, and he's about to measure where these boys are. Let's see where you are. I'm going to throw something out maybe you've never heard before. Because I haven't either until I just, never one time does the Bible mention Jesus' faith. Not one time. I went back through it, all the Gospels. Hmm. Does not mention Jesus having faith. Did Jesus have faith? Did he have to have faith? He's God. He's the God man. Doesn't mention it one time. Never even suggests that Jesus had faith. Go back and study. Go back and read it. He never said the word grace. He never used the word grace out of his mouth. But yet he embodied all grace. Folks, if, if the winds, the waves, and the water are in the boat so that the water is now coming over in the boat, and you're in the back of the boat, and you're sound asleep because he's been teaching parables all day, and he's tired, he embodies all faith. Every inch and part of him embodies faith so he's about to measure this so when you're battling winds water and waves all at the same time that's a pretty big pretty big combination he was in the stern of sleep and and here is the reaction of when we're short on grace here's the reaction you don't care you don't care you ever have anybody said that to you maybe somebody close in your family you just don't care my wife said something to me the other day. Of course, we've been coming. We, we've had sort of a COVID relationship for 20 days, and we really don't know what. The, but anyway, she said, I don't know what. She said something like, you don't listen to a thing I said or something like that. I don't remember what it was. <laughs> Anyhow, you don't care. You don't care. Care us thou not that we perish. Of course I care. You forget that I put you in this boat for a reason. Right. Waves, winds, and water, folks. Waves, winds, and water. That's why um, the whining that goes on in this culture, it just grates against my skin like fingernails on the chalkboard. He's put you in the boat for a reason. Get in the boat and be happy or get out of the boat and drown, whichever one you want. But stop your whining. Amen. He was in the stern, asleep. I've only been on the Sea of Galilee one time. When we went out there, it was just like glass, beautiful. But by the time we were almost to the other side, one of those winds had come up, and we turned around, and they stopped it because they said, eh, we know what happens out here. It can come up, and, and so uh, it's, it's like ocean waves. 
Teacher, care shall not we perish. And then he rose, rebuked the wind, and said to the sea, be still. Don't you just wish that, that he could control our spirits like he controlled them? See, everything in nature has to agree with him. When it says, let us make man in our own image, Jesus was in creation. It was a plural, he and God in creation. I don't understand that. I don't even know what I just said. I don't get that. I don't understand how it is. But that's how it is. Nature has to agree with God. Why? It's his nature. There's not a hurricane that hurricanes unless God allows it to spin. He is the God of all nature. All he said to nature was, shut up. Wouldn't you just like to say that a few times? Shut up. Shut up. No, you shut up. No, you shut up. That's where we go. He just says, be still. Because he is the master of the wind, master of the sea, master of the wave. Now listen to this, but he was not master of those 12 men in the boat. Because they're all, you don't care about us. You never did care about us. All you care about is these silly parables that we don't understand. And the wind said, but he said to them, why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? So season one in your life is when you have no faith. And that can be before salvation, pre-salvation, obviously, but it's also at a point in time in your life by which you just don't have any faith. When the doctor gives this report, you walk in and you accept that as being from God. And sometimes it is, but sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's just not. Or, or you're handed a situation by which you cannot control, you cannot fix, you cannot endure, and there is no faith whatsoever. A, a synonym of faith is trust. Every relationship is built or destroyed on, on that one thing, trust, 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 trust. If I told my, if I called my wife at 1030 tomorrow night and said, honey, uh, I, I hadn't been able to be home because uh, I've been witnessing the people down at the bar. I have done that. But on night three, if I call my wife and say, honey, I'm not going to be able to, I'm down at the bar witnessing again, things begin to change in the mind, which creates a mistrust, which destroys any relationship, every relationship. So here, this wind waves and water deal is a big deal. It's a big, it's another side thing. We, we're going to make it to the other side, but you're going to learn something as you do. No faith. There are periods in your life when you have no faith in which you, you know that you have to trust in the grace of God to give you faith because you're not going to get through this if you don't. This, you're not going to make it through. I've known people that have been sick all of their life. There was a great Southern Baptist evangelist named Manly Beasley. Oh, I, and I got to work with him on a few occasions, and he was really, really different. One particular night, I remember I was doing the music, and he was the evangelist. He comes in late. And he, he walks up there and he looks at the crowd, probably 750, 800 people there that night on a Monday night. He looks them over and he does this and he turns around to the pastor who's sitting on the little bench there and he said, Pastor, they're not ready to hear. He walked off the platform. They took him back to his hotel. What do you do? Uh, I, I mean, do I lead in just as I am now or what do I do? They're not ready to hear. Came back the next night. The crowd was unbelievable. The spirit fell down. I mean, but here was a guy so brassy enough in his faith that he said, we're not doing this tonight. I don't know many people like that. I would have faked it through. <laughs> I mean, I would have done whatever. I, I, I just didn't, I didn't, I didn't have that kind of faith. Wow. Unbelievable. Now, uh, there, are, there are no faith periods in your life by which it's not working, and you know it's not working. So what has to happen? Let's, let's move on to the next. If we don't, we're never going to never get through. The no-faith zone, Mark 440, is telling us that, wait a minute, these, are, these were his disciples. They're not unbelievers. They're the closest to him. Little faith, Matthew 17, verse 20, he replied, he replied, because you have so little faith. Truly, I tell you, if you have faith as a small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from thence to there. 
and it will move. Nothing will be impossible to you. Little faith, little faith. He replied, because you have so little faith. Even with the little faith, though, you will be allowed in little faith to take mustard seed size faith and make large things happen. Make large things happen with little faith. There's another season of our life by which he just needs a little to kindle. Uh, Brother Jimmy mentioned uh, um, the uh, the biscuits, or, or actually Benny <laughs> mentioned the biscuits, but uh, making those bis- sourdough biscuits. Now I have Dutch ovens. I have three Dutch ovens, and I and I'll I want to help you. You know, I, I'll burn the first batch. So if you're the first batch through, you don't want that one. But wh- what I'm saying about that. Uh, anticipation of eating it. I used to do Dutch oven cooking a lot uh, back in the day when I uh, kids camps and all that kind of stuff and whatever. But uh, the whole thing about that kind of cooking is you better be a patient human being, and you've got to know exactly how much fire to put on top and exactly how much to put on bottom. You're going to burn, or it's going to be raw. I have one Dutch oven that is now 19 years old on a bow hunting trip in South Alabama. I made a cherry surprise. Forgot about it, put too many coals on, came back that night. And 19 years later, you can take the lid off of that, of that Dutch oven and you can say, hmm, cherry surprise, it did not go well. 19 years, <laughs> put the lid back on. I've never used that Dutch oven again. Burn it into it. Part of the, part of, what I'm saying about this is even a little faith, it takes, you gotta, you gotta be slow here now. You gotta cultivate it. Little faith. Uh, if, if you're not in that season of life, don't look down upon those people. Don't, don't, don't point your finger at them. Oh, because with little faith, God can do much. In fact, with a little faith, look what he said, that nothing shall be impossible. It just needs a little, just a little. And when you do that Dutch oven and you only put six charcoals on top, people, oh, that's not enough. Oh, no, you just need a little heat, just a little that's consistent. You need a little bit of faith that is consistent, just a little bit that gets up every morning. Lord, it's still mustard seed. It's still mustard seed, but it's little. But, yeah, I can do much with that. Just give it to me. little boy stands up in front of the crowd. Uh, the two disciples, Philip and Andrew, bring him to Jesus. People have been there eight hours. They're tired, and they're all hungry. Jesus said, how are we going to feed these folks? And they said, well, you know, there is a lad here. He's got a little bucket. But what is that among so many? And in other words, a little bit of faith. The mustard feed, seed, and they push the kid out with his lunch pail out in front of Jesus. There he is. Do something if you can. Now, Jesus did not take the kid's lunch pail, grab it away from him, and say, I'm going to use it. He says to the boy, would you like this to be blessed? Now, folks, I don't know how out of that little lunch pail Jesus did what he did. Mustard seed is all it took. Mustard seed. So when you begin to discredit yourself, or I'm not, I mean, I'm no good down there at MTC. I can't, I can't help anybody. I'm not strong. I can't, I can't teach. I can't preach. I can't sing. I can't play. I can't, I can't do. Oh, wait a minute. Do you know what we need more than anything? We need people with a little bit of faith in the mustard seed who are willing to stand consistently day by day by day by day because that's how things get built. That's how things change. A little bit of faith, a little bit of faith is all it takes. So he says, if you just have this little faith. Now, there were three, three issues with this little faith. There are three issues. You can write it down, and everything's in threes today. Food, future, and fear. These were the three things that, that will uh, almost destroy our little faith. Food. I just told you the story. Always, when Jesus said there was a 5,000 and the 4,000, but there was always this issue, will there be enough? Is there enough God to go around in your life? Is he going to make it to the end? You know how it is in church potlucks or whatever when you're the last guy at the tail end? You know that feeling? And you know the feeling of the cooks when they keep looking and the line is just still there? And they start cutting back the rations, the portions. Why? Because there's people sitting in line. You've all been that person last in line. You're like, is there any pie left? Oh, no, that was gone. That was gone minutes ago. Um, is there enough God to go around in your life? Is there? Because it only took just a little bit, a little handful for God to do great things in your life. There is a... Uh, I have a dear friend who's traveled the world, who has cerebral palsy, 
His name is David Ring. You may have seen him on television. He used to be on all the time. And the last time he was at my church. Well, this is how he starts off. My name is David Ring. I have cerebral palsy. What's your problem? That's how he starts off. But one day I saw him on the Old Time Gospel Hour with Jerry Falwell Sr. He was on there. He came out in this suit. He looked impeccable. I said, here you go, David. And he's preaching on there about things are not as they seem. He looked unbelievable, immaculate brand. And he pulled his jacket off. He got it off. His shirt was in tatters. And the tie from here on, it just, nothing was as it seemed. That just spoke volumes to me. He was talking about faith where it looks like, oh, boy. Yeah, I mean, you'd, you you look at this family. they got to be the biggest faith-filled family in the world. Look at them. They are faith superstars. But it doesn't always work out as it appears. We just need a little bit. We don't need. We really don't need. Back years ago, when we ran buses all the time, we had like 15 bus routes, and we brought in. 250, 300 boys and girls. They asked me, uh, the bus captain came and he said, hey, Brother Bob, will you swallow a goldfish if I have 350 on the bus? My answer to him that day was, the whole world will die and go to hell before I swallow a goldfish (laughs) because you have 350 on the bus. Next year, Hey, preacher, would you preach off the top of the, st- off the top of the roof? I have to get you up there with fire. Tr- would you preach if I can have 400 on the bus? No. But see, the, the thing about trying to build faith or be great in faith is he's just looking a little bit, just a little bit. Why? Because he can move mountains with a little bit. That's what he said, didn't he? Little faith will make things possible. Food, future, and fear. Those are the three things we're battling with them today. You don't believe that? Listen, if you don't think food is the number one fear in this country, you saw what happened the the first week we were without TP. And then no canned corn. And then so when we did get canned corn, we bought 17 cases. That's human nature, is it not? Why? It's a fear. Fear of food. Now, future. You think the future is is not the number one worry today? Everybody's worried about the future. Now everybody wants you to please go through the book of Revelations. Help us to understand that. Okay, the bad guys lose. We win. Jesus Christ comes back on a white horse. We're in heaven forever. Amen. And that's the end. Amen. That's how it ends. Food, future, and fear. We are a fearful culture. And the more fear... and, and Not just COVID, but COVID has introduced to us an entire new concept of fear. Kids are running all over the streets, setting setting, uh, cities on fire, shooting people indiscriminately with causes that are absolutely ridiculous in nature. Why? They're afraid. They're afraid. Fear is stricken the heart of America. So there's no faith. There's little faith. And then let me finish up with great faith. Go with me, if you would, to Matthew chapter 8. Great chapter now. Because we're going to talk about great faith. And here's here's my observation about that. Matthew chapter 8. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I'm not worthy. Centurion means 100. He was over 100 men. I'm not worthy that you should even come under my roof. Only speak the word and my servant will be healed. For I also am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to this one, go, and he goes, and another come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to those who followed, Assuredly, I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. Great faith. There are moments in my life when I have had great faith. Stepping out on nothing, believing that God was everything. In the same, I mentioned Guatemala. My wife and I sat in Guatemala City at what is now called the Arkansas House, the Arkansas Baptist Convention built. It's now a seminary, Baptist seminary. But we sat there. Her role was to feed all those teams all week as they were coming into, flying into Guatemala City. And this is what she says to me. 
if God is leading you here, just tell me today so that I can get my heart ready and my kids ready how, how I'm going to educate them here in Guatemala. At that moment, she and I together quite possibly had, our, had a moment of our greatest faith because we were willing to step out on nothing, believing that God was everything. Now, he didn't lead in that way. But what I'm saying is great faith. Did you know he only mentions it two times? Two times. And neither time was with the Jewish people. They were both Gentiles. I think he did that to point out to the Jewish people that he came to show first, look at these people. I've never seen such great faith. I don't, I don't think we have to be in a great crusade and somebody raises someone else from the dead to see great faith. I think great faith comes upon us when we least expect it. It's like, it's like uh, heroes from a war. They don't know what they're doing. They just take the next step and see and, and what's going to happen. That's what faith does. Just take the next step. Why? Because you can't live and you can't increase in faith if you take the next step. Because there, there is a way that we're going to keep measuring this thing. Do you have more faith today than you did last week? Well, if not, wait a minute. We need to look back and measure why. The, the next time, if you look with me in uh, Matthew chapter 15, Matthew 15, he says it one other time. Verse 22. And behold, a woman, a Canaanite, came from that region and cried out to him, saying, Have mercy upon me, O Lord, son of David, my daughter is severely demon-possessed. But he said her not a word. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away. She's crying after us. And he answered and said, I was not sent except for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then she came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, It is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. And he said, And she said, Yea, Lord. Even the little dogs eat the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered and said to her, O woman, great is your faith. A rejected person, a person not considered to be the in crowd. Jesus looked at her and measured it. Whoa, this is great faith. Three seasons of your life. Now, we close with this. On this side is faith. On this side is fear. This is a, an obstacle. I, just want th- this, I want you to see this as something in your life that you're not getting over right now. I mean, you're there. And did you know that fear is what makes an obstacle an obstacle? I've heard stories about the swinging bridge. Jails told me some stories about going through there with logging trucks and how that it would drop as much as three to five feet when you're going across. Can you imagine that? But fear... Fear makes the obstacle the obstacle. Now put in there where you are. Put in there with your family, your your, your finances, your future. All this stuff that you're going through. The sickness, the wellness, the, the health, the money issues. All of this stuff becomes an obstacle because it is fueled and fed by one thing, and that's fear. That's what keeps us from having great faith. So I want you to, to put in your mind for a minute, here's an obstacle. Can you see it? I mean, can you visualize this obstacle? You can't get over it, can't get through it. I'm in a mess with it, can't get, a, get, can't get around it, and it's, and it's fueling fear every day in my life. Can't get past it, can't get past it, can't get past it. That's why many people are not in God's house in this generation. They have walked up to that obstacle so many times. They have come to an altar so many times. They have asked for prayer so many times, and they still look at that with fear, with fear, with fear, with fear. I have a good friend who's a cowboy. I mean, he's a real cowboy. He doesn't have a trail horses, but he has quarter horse, performance quarter horses. But they're, they're riding trails three weeks ago. And uh, it's a four-year-old that he's riding. And he stops in the middle of the, of the trail, and he reaches back in his saddlebag, and he opens a water bottle. And you know that sound? <laughs> Rodeo. Rodeo. That horse jumps straight up in the air. Broke six ribs, punctured a lung, four days in a trauma unit in the hospital just because he opened a water bottle on a horse that he was very confident of. Every time a horse goes down there, folks, all you guys who are really prayers, you need to be praying because anything can happen on a horse. 
Amen, Braden. <laughs> Amen, Josie. I mean, anything. Anything can happen on a horse. I've been stomped on, kicked, drugged, bucked. You name it, it's happened. And most of the time, there's something going on in my life I didn't pay attention to. I bring this to that to say, I asked uh, him uh, the other day, I said, hey, when are you going to get back on? Because that's the biggest question for a rider who has been severely hurt. When are you going to get back on? I had another friend. She competed in barrels for years. Tremendous. Horse got misdirected, hit the steel chute, coming out days upon days in the hospital, lost her memory, lost everything. When are you going to get back on? Now, here's what I'm saying. When you... When are you going to come back to this obstacle and say, I about had enough of you. I about had enough of this. I'm tired of being afraid. I'm tired of not being able to get over this obstacle. See, I, I mentioned what? Three things? Food, future, and fear. If you, if you think that food is not a big deal, folks, before the COVID hit me, I had fasted for 10 days. Now, by day five, I would have eaten the cushion out of that chair. Have you ever done that? Have you ever done that? What I'm saying is, every day got harder. What did I tell you? Faith is a fight. If you think it's anything but a fight, you're a fool. You got to finish this course. I said, I'm going to fast 10 days. But by day seven, I was walking by the refrigerator. I didn't even care. My granddaughter's baking Nestle Toll House cookies. I said, day nine. I, what are you doing? Why are you doing this? But I didn't, I didn't eat one. Didn't need one. See, what I'm saying to you is you're going to have this tough time of faith. You're going to have these obstacles by which you can't get over it. You're going to have to fight through it. You really are. So faith is on the other side. So what do I need? Well, here's the, here's the one thing we've got to do. And I illustrate this because the wheelbar is a work in progress. This is an obstacle. This is opportunity. You've got an opportunity to come over here to this obstacle and say to this, I've had it with you. That's as far as we're going to go. So I take this and I put it from an obstacle to an opportunity. Now you say, well, i got to gather up all my junk, all the stuff that I've, my whole, no, no. No, you don't gather up anything else. All you're going to do is this right here. You take this right here over the fear, and now we start moving. This is what opportunity does. It takes us to the other side. Where was Jesus trying to get those disciples? To the other side. How do you do it? You get away from the obstacle and you move toward the other side by which faith says. And because here's the thing. You're never going to get any more revelation than this right here. You're never going to be any more perfect than what God says you are right now. You're, this is it for you. You don't need anything else. You don't need another TV preacher to say that I have a, a new revelation for you. Because you don't need it. It's all sufficient. He has given it to you. So that's the only thing I need. I don't need all the junk. I don't need to carry that from over here to over here. And that's what's wrong with most of us. We keep trying to call our junk way over to the other side. It won't go. It won't go. It won't fit. Now, see, that's what storage sheds are for. Storage units. Put it all in there. Lock it up and then forget where, where you put it. There's a big sale this weekend, it's a storage units here, and everything's going to go. So they open the doors. Somebody's junk that they left back there. I'm telling you, this morning, it's time to close, past time. Obstacles are only overcome as you take opportunity to walk by faith. Otherwise, it's never going to happen. Now, every, every head bowed, every eye closed for just a moment. There are three seasons in your faith life. No faith, little faith, great faith. I'd like to tell you that our mind is always great faith, but it's not. I'd like to tell you that I've never had a no faith, but I have. So we're not here to judge one another. We're not here to look at one another. But everyone in this room Needs to square up with this obstacle because we've got them. And if you say, I don't have any obstacle, I'm not calling you a liar, but I, I'm thinking you're deceiving yourself because there are obstacles to this faith. If you can sit here, no one looking on, the quietness of this moment, and say, preacher, this is what I need. 
I, I now recognize that there is an obstacle in my path, and I do need more faith. Now, wait a minute. Don't raise a hand because it's about to get tough. I'm ready to fight this deal. I'm ready to stand up and fight. I'm ready to finish my course. I'm ready to come to the other side and say, I have kept my faith. Preacher, I need more faith. I want you and the Holy Spirit to be praying for me. If that is you, I'm going to ask you, just lift your hand honestly and say, that's me. I need more faith. God bless you. Think about it. Now your hands, there you go. Thinking about it, I need more faith. I ask one more question. Is there an obstacle in front of you that has just totally intimidated you? This obstacle has totally intimidated you. It could be a person. It could be your job. It could be your peers. It's totally intimidated. There's an obstacle in my life. Preacher, pray for me. There is a big obstacle. Would you pray for me? Would you be kind enough and honest enough to lift your hand? Thank you, dear. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Yes, yes. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. There's an obstacle. It's there. Okay. We've identified two things. Every one of us have got to get back in the fight of our faith. We need more faith. But also there are some obstacles right now in front of us. Obstacles in front of us. They're there. As we stand together now, our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. If this is the day you need to make a move in your faith... And listen, joining a church is by faith. Being baptized is by faith. God gives you grace to do it. Many, many of you said there is an obstacle. Many, many of you said, I need to fight this. I need to get back in the fight for my faith. This is your time. Get the visual of taking this fear out of the obstacle, putting in and making it an opportunity. This is your time. Many, many, many of you said, I need this. Then this altar is open for you. You come. Turn my heart, O Lord, like rivers of water. to the